Uh, is Gaith Al Omari, who is a former advisor to Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. Gaith Al Omari, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, how are you viewing uh, the events uh, of the past hour or so in the United Nations? I tend to agree with the previous speaker. I mean, it's important in that it uh, raises the diplomatic pressure one notch up. Um, however, I don't think it will produce an immediate ceasefire. Neither Israel nor Hamas feel domestic pressure nor diplomatic pressure. The U.S. is, I mean, Israel is most uh, sensitive to U.S. pressure, and we have not seen that coming. On the other hand, Hamas has to be pressured by some of its allies, like Syria, like Iran, and these do not seem to have any interest in doing this at the moment. So I'm afraid that the conflict will continue, the suffering will continue, and right now, both sides, Israel and Hamas, will try to maximize their benefits from the ceasefire. They're, in effect, uh, negotiating the ceasefire on the ground, trying to gain some political victory from this so that other side can claim that it won this war, this won this campaign, and use that to mobilize its own uh, constituency. But in the short term, so you see this actually being successful in the short term in terms of bringing about an immediate ceasefire? Not in the short term. I think what is happening right now is everyone knows that ceasefire will come within the next few days, maybe even more, up to a week or longer. So now both sides are focusing on trying to uh, through increasing violence, trying to get better terms for the ceasefire. Hamas would want to claim at the end that uh, they provoked Israel for a reason and that they got this uh, war and they achieved something out of it, probably the opening of the crossings and them being in control. Israel on the, side, on the other side would want to claim that they did this operation in order to, uh, to neutralize Hamas and they succeeded. I expect to see increased violence until we see the main players, US on the one hand and some of the Hamas allies on the other hand, pressuring the two sides to stop the violence. And I don't see this uh, happening in the immediate future, but uh, hopefully in the next few days. Okay, Gaith Al Umari, for the moment, if you could just wait there uh, and uh, just be, bear with us for a few minutes while we speak to the British Foreign Secretary, David Miliband, who joins us live from the United Nations in New York. Thanks very much for speaking to us. Uh, could you bring us up to date with exactly where we stand uh, in terms of that vote? Well, good evening. I'll be going from here to the Security Council where a vote will take place on what I believe is a consensus text calling for an immediate, durable and fully respected ceasefire and giving some important details of the framework that the United Nations believes is essential in terms of tackling the smuggling of illegal arms into Gaza and also the opening of the crossings. I think it's significant that the UN Security Council will find a way to come together to issue this clear call, but obviously the vital decisions are going to be made on the ground and it's decisions on the ground that will decide whether or not there's a ceasefire. The role of the UN should be to try to support the drive for peaceful resolution of disputes and that's certainly what I hope this resolution will contribute to. You call it a clear call. Uh, how strong is the wording? I think the wording's very strong. I think the call for an uh, immediate, durable and fully respected ceasefire uh, is strong. I think the uh, clarity uh, about the uh, smuggling of illegal arms into Gaza is strong. I think the clarity about the opening of the crossings on 2005 base is strong, and above all, the clarity about the humanitarian crisis in Gaza is strong as well. well I think there's a clear injunction. I think there's a clear injunction here, not just for people in the region, uh, for parties to the dispute, but also to all uh, states to work hard on the detailed issues and above all the humanitarian issues that are causing such a crisis. What are the implications if either side or both do not comply? Well, obviously, if either or both sides do not comply, then the ceasefire uh, will not be achieved and the uh, fighting will continue with the consequent loss of life, life and the consequent uh, devastation. But I think it's very important that we always recognize that words on a piece of paper aren't the same as changes on the ground, but the desire of all of us here is to see change on the ground that does uh, try to stem the flow of arms into Gaza that are then fired into uh, Israel and also to open the crossings to relieve the humanitarian a need that exists in Gaza. But what steps can you and your, your colleagues there take if this is not adhered to? Well, I think that the United Nations is speaking loudly and clearly and with one voice tonight, and that's very significant. It's been a very, very hard 10 days in Gaza after a very, very difficult uh, six or 12 months in the Middle East with uh, rockets being fired into Israel and IDF, Israeli Defense Force activities uh, in Gaza. I think it's very important that this loud and clear signal comes from the UN, but obviously the vital thing is to get a stop to the fighting and to try to ensure that the parties to, in the end, the 
uh, full progress in the Middle East, which is the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority are able to protect the political space that is going to be necessary for a sustained long-term solution. Mr. Miliband, it is now day 14. We're going into day 14 of this conflict. Many people out there will be wondering why this has taken so long. Well, I think that uh, that's a good question. And uh, the British government has been calling uh, from day one uh, in the United Nations uh, for an immediate halt to the violence. Uh, we, uh, as European foreign ministers, have obviously contributed to that. But I think we have to accept uh, our share of the failure that uh, the fighting continues after 14 days. The fundamental uh, issues of insecurity for Israel in the face of rocket attacks and misery for Palestinians in the face of the closure of the crossings uh, remains. And I think that we can't dodge our responsibilities, but tonight, uh, at last, the United Nations is speaking clearly with one voice. It's speaking clearly for a ceasefire, clearly for action on smuggling of arms, clearly on the opening of the crossings. And it's trying to speak up for the people of the Middle East, whether they live in Gaza or in Israel, because in the end, they're going to have to live next door to each other. Now, you, you say that uh, you acknowledge your share of the failure to bring anything uh, before now. Uh, do you feel perhaps if your words had been stronger, if there had been uh, more strong perhaps condemnation from you, this would have been happening a lot sooner and possibly saved many, many lives? Uh, no, I don't. I think that uh, the building of consensus has been difficult uh, in the United Nations. It's been a hard process, not as hard as it is for those living on the ground, but it's been a hard uh, process. And uh, in the end, uh, politics is about building consensus. Finally, we have a consensus in the international community about the need for an immediate, durable, and fully respected ceasefire. That now needs to be translated from words on the United Nations page into changes on the ground. And to that extent, the work starts today. It doesn't end today. Yeah, and how do you see that work progressing? Once we've gone beyond the immediate vote in the Security Council, uh, unanimous as it may be, uh, where do you begin with this peace process which seems bleaker than ever? Well, obviously, the uh, Egyptian initiative, uh, the talks that they're holding with Israel on the smuggling of arms issue is very significant, and the resolution supports that very strongly. Uh, that needs to be taken forward to uh, provide the basis for the ceasefire that is so essential. And then we have to ensure that the political space is protected for the negotiations that are going to be essential to build on the discussions that have happened over the last year. But the truth is, as I said at the UN Security Council on Tuesday, when this debate opened, uh, the uh, insecurity that's faced by Israelis, the uh, indignities that are faced by uh, Palestinians, are an indictment of our collective failure to bring the only solution that is uh, possible in the Middle East, which is a solution that puts uh, an independent Palestinian state living securely alongside a secure Israel. And we all have to contribute to that. There's an immediate task in respect of the ceasefire. We've then got to get down to further business. And this is an urgent priority uh, facing the new administration. I think it's significant that President-elect Obama should have said he wants to get stuck into this from day one. OK. British Foreign Secretary David Miliband uh, speaking to us there uh, from the UN. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Well, let's uh, return now to Washington and speak to Gaith Al-Umari, who we were speaking to a little earlier, uh, who is there uh, listening in to what the British Foreign Secretary has to say. Uh, your thoughts? I think he got it absolutely right. Um, the whole conflict has to be looked at in a, con uh, in a context. The context is the failure of the peace process and, indeed, Hamas's rise to power. Hamas, which is an extremist terrorist organization, rose to power because the peace process was dead. And, yes, we have a current crisis that we have to resolve taken two issues into account, one issue being the humanitarian situation, and the other issue making sure that Hamas does not benefit politically from this. But once this is over, we have to go back to the peace process. The worst scenario that I can imagine is destruction and chaos in Gaza and stagnation in the West Bank. This will help no one. We have to go immediately for a peace process, try to get something by the end of this year, a settlement freeze at a minimum, but possibly uh, even starting to talk about a peace deal. This is how we can make this sustainable. Otherwise, we'll have this kind of a conflict happening every two or three years. We had uh, President Bush speaking at just around a year ago uh, or so at Annapolis, uh, saying that he had hoped that uh, some sort of peace deal would be in place by the end of 2008. I mean, you look back at that and, I mean, it seems incredible now. It was, in some sense, unrealistic to expect such a short uh, timeline. However, a lot of progress has been made. And indeed, the talks between the Palestinians and the Israelis have uh, progressed. Things on the ground have not matched up to the political progress, and we saw this br uh, breakdown. Well, you're we have a new opportunity. Sorry. We have a new administration coming in. Sorry, uh, Mr. Alamar, you, you're, talking perhaps, that, you're not talking about sorry. Hamas. I mean, you're talking about the Fatah and the Palestinian Authority. I mean, that's just one side of the story, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, but Hamas has one clear political line. The, their line is that negotiations don't pay, violence pays. And as long as negotiations do not succeed, they are credible. If there is a peace deal, if there is the promise of a Palestinian state, Hamas will have no political message to send. And as such, they will have to come in and play the game based on internationally accepted rules. Right now, they can hold back, they can continue firing missiles, they can continue benefiting from the suffering of the Palestinian people because there is no other option on the table. If there's another option, I believe that their popularity and indeed the popularity of others like Hezbollah and other extremist organizations in the region will wane. You think uh, that the, the support for extremists will wane, uh, but do you feel that this, this conflict in the past few days has strengthened Hamas as an ideological force? We will see after the end of the conflict, it's too early to tell, but what, ha what it has done for sure is it strengthened anti-Israeli sentiment and anti-American and possibly anti-Western uh, sentiment. It's hard to see those images and not to be angry. So in the short term, yes, Hamas has been uh, strengthened or its popularity has been increased. Now it will depend. If the uh, ceasefire comes at terms which are favorable to Hamas, then obviously the popularity will increase further. If on the other hand uh, it does not, then Hamas will have to answer a very difficult question. Why did you end the ceasefire? Why did you start sending missiles into Israel? Why did you bring this destruction on Gaza? So these are all questions that uh, are too early to predict. But for sure, stagnation in the peace process will benefit Hamas. And in the short term, the violence and the suffering goes to the benefit of extremism and the benefit of hatred. Gaith Alamari joining us from Washington. Thank you very much indeed for bearing with us. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Well, let's uh, bring in Yossi uh, 